attribute. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this active travel conference for Oxford and Oxfordshire. Just in case you were wondering which conference you joined today. My name is Simon Pratt. I'll be trying to keep everybody in order today for the next 90 minutes. And I'm very pleased to have the, the honour of introducing all our speakers. And it's going to be uh, we're going to be rattling through this program. Hopefully it'll keep you interested. Um, each speaker has been allocated five minutes and we will be sharing slides with you so you'll be able to hear the voices coming through, I hope, and you, hopefully you'll be able to see the speakers. It's a bit weird for us. We can't see you, but um, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to see us as the, the slides appear on the screen. Um, so we, we're going to be looking back over the last 12 months with a number of projects that have been led by the Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Travel. So we're reporting on those and we're, we're delighted to acknowledge the financial support of the Low Carbon Hub, who have uh, paid for the administration and organisation of those five projects that you're just about to hear about. Um, we're also going to be looking forward to the future with uh, Professor David Rogers, who's going to give us a rundown of growth plans for the future and how we might or might not achieve zero carbon through to 2050. And we do invite your questions and comments during the presentations. Please use the Q&A function. Many of you will be familiar with the Zoom chat function, but please use the Q&A. And your, if we can answer your questions during the presentations, we'll, we'll attempt to do that. Otherwise, we'll have a, a, a roundup Q&A session once David speak, finished speaking. We've got um, 15 minutes allocated for that, so we'll look at your questions throughout. Um, if they can't be answered in, in the chat, in the Q&A function, then we will uh, pick them up and I'll be asking the panellists to respond at that point. Uh, th this conference and the presentations are being recorded. So um, everybody's on best behaviour today. Uh, and this is both for, for a record for, for you as participants, but also for uh, we can share the link with others who weren't able to attend today. We hope um, it will be of lasting interest for years to come. And we are, we are looking for constructive debate. Um, we welcome challenge. So if you don't agree, please let us know in the Q&A. Um, and we look forward to um, working with you all on these important topics in future. So, and, and we're particularly delighted to have a number of representatives from groups outside the city of Oxford. We, COSAT has been in existence for a little over two years now, and we've been very conscious of our city focus. And we, are, we, we always intended to be a coalition for the county as a whole. So we're delighted to invite three speakers from three of the market towns across the county. And we're very much hoping to expand the membership of the coalition to include some of those market towns and get a wider perspective on active travel and transport issues across the county. So I'm going to hand over to Tucker, our first speaker. And we should have some slides popping up. Fantastic, thank you, Simon. For that introduction, so I'm uh, Robin Tucker um, and I've been uh, uh, leading the Oxfordshire Cycling Network for about uh, six years now um, and in many ways that's a, uh, I guess, partly a predecessor of the um, of COSAT. Uh, we ourselves are a coalition of um, about 30 uh, cycling groups and uh, campaigners uh, from across the county. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. 
and um, uh, so cycling is um, quite popular in uh, in Oxfordshire. Don't don't get the idea from people who might tell you it's a tiny number of people. There are, in fact, 27% of uh, adults who are regular cyclists, which makes about 150,000 adults and probably 180,000 people who cycle in total, if you include uh, the children, uh, assuming about the same rate, uh, which is quite a salient number as we come round to the uh, county and uh, some of the district council elections in May more on that uh, later and um, and of course we have many cycling groups and clubs and organizations uh, the one I happen to know the number um, because I'm a secretary for uh, Cycling UK Oxfordshire as well another of my cycling affiliations uh, that uh, that uh, group has uh, 1800 members uh, in the county and of course there are lots of other cycling groups ranging from the sporty to uh, campaigning groups and uh, leisure groups of all different kinds, um, and and the uh, blue and red names on the on the map here are uh, the groups that uh, have uh, members in um, in the Oxfordshire Cycling Network. So we share information, we develop views, um, we align responses to consultations, and we really coordinate to help improve conditions for uh, people who to cycle. Um, across the county really with the idea of, of helping everybody to cycle it's not for people who consider themselves cyclists it's really to help everybody and have representation now on a couple of influential groups in the county and if we can have the next slide uh, so the red ones are highlighted because they'll be talking shortly um, and one of the things we're aiming to do is develop a whole set of cycling walking plans uh, the County Council has started doing this and they've uh, now developed plans in Oxford and Bicester. Um, but uh, lockdown actually provided the opportunity for um, many of us in uh, community groups to start developing our own plans. Um, we've uh, completed one in Abingdon, which Sarah will tell you about shortly. And uh, groups are starting up uh, doing their own plans in many of the locations that you'll see on uh, that table there. I won't go through all of them, but the, the market towns are very important. If you take the top five market towns there, they have a combined population significantly more than Oxford. And then there are a whole uh, uh, set of further towns with a population in the teens uh, and then several more. Um, with populations in the in, in several thousands, so these these towns are really important in their own right. Um, so with that, um, there's a you get the sense there's a lot of activity that's really uh, in many ways been um, uh, been nudged on by uh, the fact we've had, we've had a bit more time to uh, both ride our bikes and think about uh, cycling and uh, and indeed walking. Um, over this period and, uh, and the importance of having uh, uh, better and cleaner and uh, more active modes of travel to keep us healthy. So with that I'll uh, pass us on to the uh, next speaker which I think is John who will be talking about uh, them starting uh, development of their plan in Wantage and Grove. Thanks very much Robin. <clears throat> Hello everybody. Um, I wanted to start off by just uh, giving you a bit of a feel about where Wandershing Grove is. I, I work at the University in Oxford and I'm often surprised by how many colleagues only have the vaguest idea what I'm talking about when I mention Wantage. So can we go to the next slide? Um, there's sort of this there's, there's odd situation with Wantage and Grove. Wantage is a very ancient market town, birthplace of King Alfred, population roughly 13,000. I saw Robin's figures on the earlier slides. I, I, that was the last census and I'm trying to guess where we might be now. Grove is, is a, was a little village uh, about a mile outside Wantage, very tiny, sleepy village originally. Um, it was the home of an enormous uh, American Air Force base during World War II, now, now the site of enormous housing development. Uh, and its population has risen very rapidly since the war, a big development in the 60s and 70s. So population now roughly 10,000 and growing very quickly. So we've got this slightly odd situation now where Grove is recognised as the biggest village in Oxfordshire. Really, it's a town, but it doesn't have the kind of 
infrastructure or indeed the kind of um, political governance that towns would have. So it's a bit of a local debate about whether Grove should be a town. But in practical terms, Wantage and Grove are rather intertwined. And so I've, I've, I've tended to think of them as slightly as this kind of twin city model. If we can move on to the next slide, give you a rough idea of where it is. So you can see down the bottom there, Wantage with Grove immediately to the north. And we are, as you can see, very much down in the south of the county. Um, so not too far from Didcot and Abingdon. And that's, so that just gives you a rough feel. Next slide gives a bit more of a zoom in, just to give you a sense of the sort of urban area. You'll see that want, both Wantage and Grove are quite tightly constrained. What I will say, looking at Grove to the north there, you'll see there's a big empty space to the left of it, to the west. That actually is where the old air force, uh, where the old airfield is. And that is rapidly being filled in with a, a housing development to such a size that it's going around something like 50% um, extra housing and therefore population to Grove. So that's one of one of the interesting challenges we face, very, very significant um, development in, ar around Grove in particular, but actually Wantage is also starting to have its fair share as well. So that's a, that's a major challenge and perhaps an opportunity for us. Not very much has been done, um, frankly, in terms of active, um, active travel stuff. Uh, when Grove was first built in the 60s and 70s, interestingly, looking back, it was quite well done and there's an awful lot of interactions, pathways, alleyways, tracks, green spaces interspersed around what was quite a big estate development. It's interesting always to look back and say, well, they, they did things quite well in those days, but without necessarily having the terminology that we now use. But um, certainly there hasn't been a huge amount done. But for example, you know, Grove has uh, is a feeder into the one major secondary school, which is actually a two site school in Wantage. So one of the things we've looked at already is, you know, transportation for school children getting to school and so on without, you know, parents feeling the need to get the car out. So we just, so it's a relatively new thing. The last few years we started thinking about actually travel and putting a, a coalition of the willing together to see what we might be able to do. If we move on to the next slide, a bit more detail on that. So at the moment we're talking about a particular activity. We're not quite sure whether we need another campaigning group we're not sure if we do what we'd like to do more is bring together a local sort of a loose coalition we're calling it a working group at the moment to take on the fact that there's been such you know interesting changes nationally with, with gear change and with the new design standards available and thinking about local cycling and walking infrastructure as you know i think many of us were familiar with the phrase lc whip um, our feeling is that Wantage and Grove is of a size that warrants having its own LC whip. Theoretically, the County Council might do that. We're pretty sure we're quite down low on the list of those that might be done there. So our approach is to think through whether we might produce effectively a sort of locally developed provisional LC whip, which could become something which can then be taken forward, perhaps, and sort of uh, authorised in some way by the County Council. I know having done something similar, we'll hear about that a little bit later on. <clears throat> but what we're trying to do primarily is gather stakeholders together. So as it happens, I'm the chairman of the local Cycling UK um, Leisure Cycling Group, Cycling UK Wantage. Um, Sustainable Wantage is, is a sort of natural ally and we have very good connections with them. Harburg relates to the Harwell Bicycle User Group. Harwell Campus um, is a very big employer of people who live in Wantage and Grove. And so they uh, are a natural ally as well. Good connections with the councillors at all the various council levels too. So that's also helpful. Move on to the last slide, if we could. Yeah, just to say that apart from developing the LC, we're, we're looking at the, in a sense, the usual things that these kind of groups will, will want to do. So as I, I mentioned, working with the secondary school, we actually helped them last summer to get a travel plan developed and completed and on their website for the first time. So that was a bit of a success. But in a sense, the usual stuff, you know, trying to discourage too much through traffic, safe walking and cycling, particularly looking at the new developments. And um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say for now. So we're at an early stage and you'll hear more from others now who are rather more advanced. I think George from Bista is next on the list. Thank you. Hi, thanks, John. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm uh, George Bennett. I'm uh, here representing the Bista Bike Users Group. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll give you a little bit of background about um, So next slide, please. So, um, oh, I think I skipped one. Sorry. This, so this is Bista. Um, yes, this is us. I'm a, a little bit behind. So this is us. This is the core of the Bista bug team. I'm in the middle. 
but I'm speaking really on behalf of uh, Rick on the left and Paul on the right. We are, although we're all uh, middle-aged white males, we have a diverse set of skills and uh, we've been cracking on with Vista Bug for about a year now. So next slide, please. And this is the context of Vista. As Robin mentioned, we're about 30,000 inhabitants, but um, there's massive growth plans for, for Vista. Um, on the map on the right, the sort of core of Vista is in existence and everything in the color is either being developed or will be developed or is, uh, is uh, on, the, on the cards to be developed. So by 2034, we'll be almost twice as big in terms of number of uh, residents here. And tellingly, myself, Paul and Rick are all new to Vista in the last couple of years. So that kind of tells you how the town is changing. It's pretty car dependent. Pretty much everyone has at least one car in their household. Um, but um, OCC has committed to tripling cycling by 2031. Um, so we're going to help them do that. So if you move to the next slide, please. We have been, because of the number of planning applications, we have been able to really cut our teeth and uh, put our oar in to make sure that we can improve the cycling infrastructure as much as possible because there's so much going on. Uh, this example is a, a roundabout that's planned, has been approved, and we really went to town to make sure it applied. It was um, following the latest guidance and being really active travel friendly. Um, we objected a lot. We can't say we won that battle, but um, in terms of the longer strategy, uh, we think we're on the right path. So if you just next for the next half of the slide. So these are a couple of examples of junctions that have recently been put forward and are pretty much night and day difference to the one on the left. So we really feel that what we've been doing has been having an effect. And I'd like to explain a little bit about how we've gone about doing that. If you go to the next slide, please. And one more. Yes, this is our, our playbook for how to um, affect planning, pretty much in logical order as it would occur chronologically. Um, we have spent a lot of effort knowing the relevant guidance, LTN, plans, LC whips, et cetera, design for streets, um, better than the developers and the highway officers themselves. So we're not at a disadvantage when we go into the, into the process. We engage really early in the process and we do not, and when I say we do not, Paul are, um, is really hot on this. He will not, he's like a dog with a bone. He will not let it, he will not be fobbed off or ignored in this process. And we uh, escalate whenever we don't get uh, responses from officers up to the relevant level in, in Cherwell Council or Oxfordshire Council. And we use a lot of freedom of information requests and uh, use the regulations where we can. And also we escalate to councillors, um, especially when a sort of breach of guidance is, is looking, like, looking likely to highlight that well in advance of any planning uh, approvals. Um, we are collaborative in our approach, but um, we have, as we would say, sharp elbows, and we are always ready to consider legal action if the provision is going to be discriminatory. And uh, just yesterday, there's been, um, I can't say too many details, but we've had a nice a barrier removed, which was essentially discriminatory on an underpass going under the A41 on a key link. We're a consultee for planning applications that affect highways, so we get advance warning what's going on, and um, we engage very collaboratively with councillors, regardless of their position or affiliation, to make sure that in advance of the planning committee, they are well aware of our position and the um, implications for guidance and for active travel and cycling specifically. And we really love to mobilise our own members, which is a growing cohort of people and the wider public um, through social media channels, um, for all the consultations, et cetera, which is the topic of the next slide. Can you have the next slide, please? So this is a few things that we've been doing. Um, we have a web page, et cetera, the usual Facebook, Twitter, Instagram channels, um, which basically we use to praise the um, measures that have been implemented. Bottom left is a new shared path that's been put in as part of the Emergency Active Travel Fund that was opened just um, 
couple about a week ago. Um, top left is something we've been doing, delivering books for local business, which is always cur curries great favour with um, with people to uh, tone down the uh, the radical image of cycling in a you know predominantly car based town, and also putting forward ideas about how to solve issues um, and when consultations come up. So if you just have the next click. And these are just a few things that we are also trying to do and trying to get off the ground in our sort of early days. So really pushing and monitoring the progression of the LC WIP, making sure it doesn't become a dead document and actually comes into life. Um, a vintage bike event, we have Vista Heritage on site, um, which is, uh, we're good to support them, supporting local businesses and helping us get our buddy scheme up and running. So next slide, last slide. Just to say thanks and check out all the information we've got on our website, vistabug.org. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, George. Over to Sarah Leaning from Addington, please. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so yes, hi, uh, I'm Sarah Leeming. So I live in Abingdon. I've um, been living in uh, Abingdon now for about 10 years. Um, I'm sure some of you know the town, but for those that don't, then it's about four or five miles south of Oxford, around 33,000 uh, population. Uh, a few key physical assets to mention, which uh, include the River Thames. Uh, obviously, it's, that's a great asset, but it does throw up some challenges in terms of transport connectivity. And then we also have the National Cycle Network, Route 5, which has um, recently experienced uh, a few upgrades. So that connects the the town with Oxford and uh, south down into Didcot. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about two groups um, in Abingdon and they are Abingdon Livable Streets and Abbey Bike. So yeah, so we started uh, Abbey Bike in round about 2019. Um, so we, we initially, there was a call out for volunteers from a guy called James uh, Wigmore. He may be listening in today. Um, so James put a call out for volunteers to help improve cycling facilities in Abingdon. Um, so I noticed this request in my local bike shop and got in touch with, with James. It was a few months later uh, that the group, um, a group of six, a whole six of us uh, met at the King's Head and Bell pub in Abingdon. Uh, I'm sure there's many a community uh, action group that starts its journey in the, in the local, uh, local pub. So our group had representation from COSAT, uh, Robin was part of the group. Uh, we also had representation from Abingdon, Abingdon Freewheelers Cycling Club, uh, from Sustrans and the district's uh, cycle champion, a guy called Eric De La Hart. So it took us a few meetups, uh, which involved the usual uh, groaning about poorly served uh, cycling and how poorly served cycling is, um, before we got to the stage of actually focusing in on some key actions to take forward. So one of those actions was to widen the diversity of the group, which consisted of, at that point, just one woman, myself, and five middle-aged blokes. Uh, and we wanted to improve the diversity of that group. Um, and we wanted also to recognise that it was more than just about being about cycling. It was about making Abingdon more accessible, more walkable, more livable. So we reached out to the local carbon cutters uh, group in early 2020, I think it was. And um, we came together, uh, yep, we came together and we got very proficient in, in using Zoom very quickly because it was about April time that we came together. And I think you all know what was going on around about then. So as you might expect, the Carbon Cutters group were very supportive of broadening beyond cycling. Um, and so we invited Scott Urban from Oxfordshire Liverpool Streets to talk to us about that group's focus at the time which was around low traffic neighbourhoods for Oxford, and it still is something that they're very focused on at the moment. Um, and how we might come under the umbrella of both organisations, Oxfordshire Liverpool Streets, but also COSET. So we landed on calling our combined group Abingdon Liverpool Streets, and we felt it was important to retain the Abbey Bike group that we started with, still as a distinct group, um, which would keep its um, cycling focus. So we meet monthly and representation includes OCC, um, Oxford County Council officers and town and district councillors. So our key achievement is the 
which you've heard a few people mention already, so it's good that news is getting out. Um, our key achievement is the Abingdon Cycling and Walking Network Plan, which I'll come on to. Other achievements include inputting into the neighbourhood plan, um, school and workplace questionnaires, uh, cycle parking audit. Uh, we want to do more around comms activity, um, but we've also been quite proactive around consultation um, responses. So our future priorities include pushing for our network plan to become an official LCWIP, so like local cycling walking infrastructure plan. Um, we're pushing for school streets and we actually have uh, St Nicholas School on board for the school street six week pilots that are uh, being delivered by OCC and Sustrans. Well, hopefully that will kick off in May. We're pushing for 20 miles per hour, particularly around uh, the town centre. And we're at the process of beginning to scope out um, low, low traffic neighbourhoods um, for the town. But we do have a few good old 1980s, uh, possibly older modal filters already in the town. Um, and it's fair to say that I think many of Abingdon's neighbourhoods are quite low trafficked already. But we have um, a few ideas about, about where to focus in regards to that. Okay, next slide, please. So our main achievement, as has been mentioned, um, is the Abingdon Cycling and Walking Network Plan. So we're claiming that this is one of the first uh, community-led LC WIPs. Uh, we largely got there due to the efforts of, of Robin Tucker. Um, so thank you, Robin. Um, but it was certainly a team effort. Um, it involved over 30 people helping to survey routes over approximately a three-month period. So this slide is an example of an output from a route survey. Next slide. So we wanted to, we do want to push for a phased approach and what you'll see from this slide, uh, basically there's lots of red lines were plotted in September, um, representing more than one casualty recorded by Police Stats 19 every year. So through to something more aspirational and colourful um, at the end, um, which is representing medium to high quality routes. So achieving this full plan is no doubt a long way off. But we will work to push for low cost priorities to be implemented over the next few years. We've heard a rumour recently that the technical part of the LC WIP uh, being produced by Oxford County Council is almost there. So we are hopeful that OCC may complete the full document later this year, which should, in theory, help us prioritise funding for Abingdon. And if you want to see, next slide please. If you want to actually see the full plan, then um, when you get the slide deck, you'll be able to click on this link. Okay, over to Alison on 50 Minute Neighbourhoods. Great, thank you very much. And that was wonderful, inspiring work from the market towns. I'm delighted that everybody's working towards uh, a common goal. Um, I'm Alison Hill, I'm chair of Cyclox, the cycle campaign and advocacy group for Oxford city and surrounding. So very interested in the whole commuter route as well. Um, I'm talking about 15 minute neighborhoods. Uh, this, this came out of a piece of work um, that COZAT embarked on, on um, active travel data. Um, the interest in 15 minute neighbourhoods was emerging over the last two years or so and it's clear that it needed to be a key policy driver for the Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Travel. Um, and while we were undertaking some work on a data project, we spotted that a wonderful Cyclox member called Will Ray was working on some accessibility in indexes, particularly for supermarkets in Oxford. So we nabbed him and got hold of him and, and he was very happily um, uh, willing to do some work for COZAT and Cyclox. Can I have the next slide? The concept of a 15 minute neighbourhood is uh, arose from uh, the uh, Professor Marco, well, I've forgotten his Carlos Moreno at the Sorbonne, and um, he this this was taken up. The concept was taken up by Anne, Hidal Anne Hidalgo, the Mayor of Paris, and in fact, she has really made it her mission to improve the living conditions and environment of Parisians. 
So she's turned miles of major road into um, roads that are for walkers and cyclists with a transformation of Paris over a very rapid period. Um, and uh, the, uh, the concept is obviously being taken up all over the uh, all over Europe and America and elsewhere in the world uh, because it makes so much sense and so and what it is what is it it's a neighborhood where the daily necessities are within 15 minutes by foot or bike and including that list of uh, uh, amenities that on the slide with the aim of reducing car dependency taking away out of town retail parks and supermarket developments and preventing urban sprawl so a very kind of wonderful and essential concept. Can I have the next slide? In, in COZAT, we're therefore going to really pursue this concept because it just is so such an important one. Um, and one of our very first activities was to, to work with Will Ray on this walkability index. He, Will is a geographer and spatial mapper um, and obviously a whiz kid at producing things like this. Um, and the index that he's produced is a, a, an index using proximity to supermarkets, green space, that's parks, playing fields and allotments, pubs, schools and GP surgeries. And um, don't ask me anything about the techniques, but he's been able to bring together the, the um, the access by street. So this is all done by street to give you a feel for where in Oxford City there are 15 minute neighbourhoods. So you can see that the, um, the dark blue is extremely walkable and the dark red is unwalkable. And you can see where the um, most walkable areas of the city are. That's in Summertown, really close to the district centres, Summertown, Jericho, Cowley Road, Temple Cowley, Headington. And the least walkable areas tend to be those in the peripheries of the city, uh, in particular Blackbird, Lees, Cowley and Barton, which of course are the more deprived areas. And so it, that has a very strong policy um, implication therefore. Next slide, please. So the, the policy changes that need to be um, made to create 15-minute neighbourhoods are these. This, this list very much came from Professor Moreno's list um, when he was writing about 15-minute um, neighbourhoods. Creating affordable homes and diversity in housing development, and I'm sure David will be covering a lot of that as he um, talks later on. Um, bringing jobs and services into local areas, through incentivizing inward investment. And I've put a picture here of Poundbury because that is a, a real model village which has created a lot of work space to bring in employment into that area. Um, maximizing use of local community buildings so that schools are used 24 seven, for instance. Um, then creating safer local communities that really help people. So that's the kind of low traffic neighborhood type of community that helps people feel they can get out of their cars. And adopting 15 minute neighborhoods as a key principle in local plans and local transport strategies. So for COSAT, this is going to be a major policy drive over the next year or two. And we're doing a lot more, we'll be doing a lot more work this year with the low carbon hub funding that we have so um, luckily and received. Thanks, Low Carbon Hub, whoever is watching. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. I'm standing in, or sitting in, I should say, for Neville, who is, uh, is unfortunately unable to join us. He has been leading our Co a COSAT project on bike hangers and the first slide shows our inspiration. This is an example from Waltham Forest, uh, North East London Borough, I'm sure many of you have visited. And this, it's, it's interesting that in Oxford now we're seeing low traffic neighbourhoods. This is an example where there's a, a street closure to prevent um, car access. But it's, it's, at the same time, it's created some public space. And on the right of the screen there, you can see the bike hangar, which is a, a secure cycle parking enclosure. Next slide, please. 
So th this was essentially a research project. We haven't yet seen the first installation in Oxford or anywhere else in Oxfordshire, as far as I'm aware. So this is um, Neville's notes on the need for such things. Uh, I'm sure everybody can think of streets where there is no um, on-street parking and you get bikes um, locked to, uh, da down pipes and you know street furniture wherever they can and uh, they're a significant hazard for other users of the street. Next one please. And so we did, we have identified a number of streets where we think they'll be particularly useful, typically terraced housing with no access to rear gardens. Um, and they really need to be local. So even in very busy streets, there's usually a location that could be used. And ultimately we, we do advocate the use of uh, the street itself. And there are a number of locations, certainly in the city centre where car parking spaces have been reallocated for cycle parking. And the next slide gives an example from London. Here you can see two hangars on street, obviously much more space, space efficient. Each one can take six bikes. Um, and they, if you double up, there's two in roughly a, a car length. So you can get 12 bikes into a space occupied by one car. Not saying that it's easy to take out car parking. There's often a lot of strong lo local opposition, but conversely, once the, the cycle hangers start to uh, go in, th there's huge demand for them. And a number of London boroughs have massive waiting lists in the thousands of people. And the final slide uh, just summarizes the cost. Um, they're not cheap to install, um, but actually, the, the calculations we've done suggest that they, they could be self-financing. And certainly, Oxfordshire Liverpool Street looked into this model of maybe raising private finance um, and inviting subscriptions. So anybody out there who wants to take the risk, put a bit of money up for investment, is very welcome. There, having said that, of course, it, it's easier said than done. And there's quite a few hoops to jump through to reallocate um, public highway space and obviously would need to get the county council and the city council in Oxford on board for that. So that was just a quick whistle stop tour and thanks for Neville for putting those slides together. Just a quick reminder to speakers to keep to time please. We're just running a couple of minutes over so not doing too badly. I'm going to hand over if I get with a, a, a big, we've got Brenda now with two sessions. So she's got 10 minutes to speak on the next two items. Thank you, Brenda. Simon, um, as, as I think you've heard, there are many reasons why we're interested in, in healthy streets and active travel. And quite often they provide additional benefits uh, to uh, the, the city. I'm mainly talking about Oxford in my presentation. Um, and we can enhance the centre of the city. Next slide, please. And St Giles is one area where we've, we've looked at the opportunities. Uh, there's some wonderful townscape. It's a, it, St Giles is a, is a lovely, lovely area, um, most of which is wasted on cars and tarmac at the moment. There is, for instance, no pedestrian crossing, um, which isn't helping active travel properly. Um, there are no bus stops, but that's actually almost a benefit because the flow of traffic is unhindered. Um, it's actually waiting to be transformed. Uh, and we could do that today. It would be very easy to take out the parking. And it's going to be increasingly important that we do something because the uh, Oxford LC WIP, the um, Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plan, uh, wants the number of cyclists to double by 2031. It's already quite well used. Uh, and at the same time, there are plans to halve the number of cars. So the imbalance that exists between pedestrians and cyclists on one hand and cars and parking on the other needs addressing. Next slide, please. 
Now, what you can see here is two cross sections. The top one is today, the west is on the left and the east is on the right. And you can, you can see, can you, can my, anyone see my arrow? Oh, good, okay. So there's the little, little pass, parking, parking trees, small cycle route, large road, and the same on the other side. And it would be perfectly possible to, to uh, remove the parking, to narrow the, the amount of space that is for the, the cars in the future, still perfectly adequate for buses and everything going on, it, to make for a wider cycle track, uh, and to have fantastic spaces, probably not quite as this um, street mix shows, it's quite so full of people, but a wonderful new central space. Um, you can fill it with, uh, with activities like um, cafes, um, places to come and see, sculpture. Um, somebody suggested we had our own London Eye, which I thought was quite an interesting thought, um, and generally transform the whole area. And as I say, it's not dependent on anything like bus gates. You can take the parking out tomorrow, and we need to be reducing the, the uh, car traffic. Anyway, next slide, please. In future, it might be possible to think of um, St. Giles being a little like Las Ramblas in Barcelona, where instead of the people being on the outside and the traffic in the middle, we actually have the people in the centre and the traffic on the edge. That's a much longer term um, issue, but uh, it's, it provides a wonderful place for a passeggiata in the evenings to have sculptures, to have street art, to generally go and meet your friends. And one of the things we did uh, in, uh, the, in July was to run a pop-up shop. And St. Giles was one of the 14 activities that we um, portrayed. Next slide, please. Uh, just looking at some of the aspects of providing healthier streets, quieter streets, uh, more pedestrianisation. We did it just before the County Council had put in their bid to the government for funding, so we hoped we'd have some influence on that. Next slide, please. Uh, but yes, so, and, and we looked at issues around safer cycling. What do you mean by a segregated cycle there, the cycle route? Um, what's the role of cargo bikes? We're very keen on um, taking delivery vans out of the centre of Oxford and replacing it with um, zero carbon deliveries, for instance, cargo bikes. Next slide, please. And of the various activities that we looked at, um, Highs Bridge Street was one. These are, these are ideas, they're options, they're not plans, they're just to, to get us thinking mentally about how to improve the centre of Oxford. And one, one reason why that's so important uh, is that uh, we've, we've got a uh, reduction in the amount of shopping, with, certainly in the centre with Boswell's and Ebenham's going. Um, and so what are we going to do to make the centre of Oxford more attractive? And certainly the route, Highsbridge Street, leads to the station behind us and is particularly unattractive. The pavements are dreadful. Cycling's not much better. It's very narrow. So one of the suggestions is that we take cars out of Highsbridge Street. There's a perfectly adequate alternative route along Park End Street, which is off to the right. Um, so so it's down there. Um, you take out the Worcester Street car park and make it into um, a, a lovely central area. Um, I was thinking about it this morning, and I, I don't know if anybody knows Vienna, but in Vienna they've got a wonderful um, museum quarter with a huge area and some lovely, funky, brightly coloured seating. We could do that and have fountains. Just be a fun place. Next one, please. Uh, another area we looked at in the pop-up shop was Broad Street. This is looking along Broad Street towards the east, um, uh, where it's dominated by parking. Next one, please. And we made some suggestions with thanks to, uh, the, I should have said that the Hythe Bridge Street was thanks to Joel Darby's beautiful drawing. And this is thanks to Andy Coram's uh, Photoshop. Again, it's just a thought. What would you like Broad Street to be like? 
but you want a central bandstand or fountain. Uh, you've actually got here the, the, the cycle routes uh, along the edges with people again in the middle. This is a, the whole Broad Street discussion is now being led by the Oxford Preservation Trust and others. So again, it needs a, a wonderful, uh, it provides a wonderful opportunity to enhance the public realm in Oxford. Thanks, next slide. One of our most popular activities that we looked at in the pop-up shop was Ifley Road. Uh, this, uh, in this, um, again, this is another Andy Coram one. Uh, it, in, in, um, this looks at the opportunities to provide a segregated cycle track. It might just have pollards, it might have pollards and planters. It removes the on-street parking because in a large length of the street, there's opportunities for people to park in front of their houses. Uh, because it's planned to fit in with connecting Oxford and bus gates and uh, reduction in traffic, there is no need for a bus lane. There is less traffic and so therefore there's room for the, uh, the, the cycle track. Uh, last slide please. Well, Oh, there we are. Uh, thanks to Suhara Puma for this cartoon. All of this reminds us we must get rid of the cars, particularly cars that are stuck in traffic, uh, in traffic jams, idling away, polluting, uh, reduce, re reducing the health of our city, giving us this nasty toxic air, uh, and um, generally make me want to try and make Oxford and our um, friends in these market towns, as you've been hearing, in the places which are nicer to live in. Thank you. Now we get a short video to show you. This was this was of people around the pop-up shop and their views. coronavirus car numbers have dropped and it's kind of really opened up people's minds and people's eyes about the kinds of benefits that you get from having less cars. Uh, people are hearing bird song, people are walking more, cycling more and when you do all those things you bump into your neighbours, you see the sun, you have the wind in your hair, you know it's, it's you're, you're more alive. My ideal Oxford Street would have much wider pavements room for cyclists to travel in groups rather than single file. Often certain roads around Oxford tend to be heavily potholed and with lack of markings uh, it's quite dangerous as a cyclist. It, originally when they started at the school um, I was quite excited at the prospect of cycling until I realised the reality of how dangerous the roads are and so yeah I just wouldn't risk it. What I would love is to just be able to feel free to go along on a segregated cycle route all the way into town and then out to other parts of the city on absolutely lovely, proper, dedicated, segregated cycle routes. Like, there's just got to be something done about the congestion. I think that's like the main thing, really. I'd like to be able to hear the sound of the birds and the breeze in the trees on St Giles and. I'd like to be able to breathe. I'm always holding my breath because of the smell of traffic fumes. And data published by the government and by Public Health England uh, show that within Oxfordshire, that's the county, uh, approximately 5.5%, that's just over 1 in 20 of all deaths, can be attributed to the particulate element of air pollution. I think if we could see the value of the beauty of Oxford, instead of just seeing it as a place to get through, so that people could not only get to places on foot and by bike or by any method of transport that isn't burning oil, um, but also enjoy the journey. Keeping physically active is one of the most important things anyone can do to, 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 for their health. Uh, it keeps their weight down, it improves their mental health, but perhaps most importantly of all, its uh, absence of physical activity is one of the most important risk factors for coronary heart disease, which remains one of the major killers in this country. Children now, can't just play in the street. I used to play outside my house. Now they can't. They can't just play in the street because the, it's just constant cars going past. And also all the pollution that the 
the the quality of the air that they've got. So I think for the children it would be absolutely brilliant. So really be able to see everything, which we can't at the moment. Really be able to breathe deeply, which we can't at the moment. And to see more trees and benches and fountains and things. It could be a, a truly inspiring city. We want, we all want the good stuff, the, the segregated cycle lanes, the um, walking, the fountains, the greenery, the benches, but we don't get those without taking some cars out of the city. So by putting bus gateways in, we're not stopping for people from driving, we're just stopping people from driving across the city. So they have to go around the outside and then come into the area that they want to get to. My ideal city for the future, for maybe the next 50 years, would be to have a broadly pedestrianised city centre, um, maybe along the lines of Italian cities with plazas, waterfalls, um, fountains. Lots of greenery, uh, lots of plants, um, natural beauty, uh, some um, tables, some chairs, some seating, relaxation areas. Um, it's really important that there's places for people to sit, relax, to commune, to talk to each other. Um, and I just think anything which really enhances and adds to the vibrancy of the city centre um, is going to be great. I think it would attract a lot more tourists. Um, the, the space for them to just walk along the streets without the noise, without the traffic, a safer a safer place to be, to be honest, you know, and here, Broad Street, it's the jewel in the crown. It's just an amazing space and it, we could do a lot better with it. And, and I hope we do a lot better with it. Well, I'm afraid we have no choice. We have really no choice. We've got to change. Just like we have always done it. I mean, it, it's, people forget how much we have changed. That's like the way we couldn't walk all the way to India after like an aeroplane. That's a change. Change is an important part. Similarly, we have to change things like we cannot come by car anymore. We use buses or walk or cycle. Natural. So this is the perfect time to change after coronavirus when we've seen what it's like with less cars on the road. And it's a choice. We can design for walking and cycling and people will walk and cycle. If you design for driving, people will drive. Because on, on cycles, we're all the same. And it literally does mean longer life expectancy with less air pollution and I would rather have a longer life expectancy for myself and my children than have more, more opportunity to drive into the centre to go shopping. I don't know if my, my uh, grandkids will be here in a hundred years but I hope if they come visit they can at least get a bike and uh, see where I went. I might love shopping but I don't love shopping as much as I love life. You hear this kids? <laughs> <laughs>
called Partnering for Prosperity. And that partnership has five important pillars. In fact, you can start at the bottom. The bottom, the 163 billion, is the prize. This is what all this development will give us, an increase in economic output. To achieve that prize, we have to have a million new jobs, a million new houses across the arc, and to join up those houses to uh, employment centres, we needed the Oxcam Expressway, a motorway standard road between Oxford and Cambridge, and East West Railway. Could I have the next slide, please? Now, within that report, they also suggested the possible distribution of those million houses. We have here a map. The outlines are more or less the counties of the arc. They're not quite the counties. And the pie charts indicate uh, the number of houses of different sorts that we'll look at in a minute. In Oxfordshire's case, for example, the total number of houses in that pie chart is 300,000 of the million houses. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, the significance of the different uh, coloured sections in the, part, the chart is that the pink are currently planned homes, all the homes in current local plans. Next, please. In dark blue are houses for London commuters. This is actually for London overspill. And the next, please. And the darkest segment, the dark orange, by far and away the biggest of all of them, are the houses which would be unlocked by the proposed Oxford Cambridge development, the development plan for the region. So before we go on, first of all, notice 23% of those million houses are already earmarked for London commuters. We will be effectively part of that dormitory donut. Next, please. Question is, how many uh, houses, uh, what sort of increase in Oxford's total housing stock and indeed across the arc do those new houses represent? I mentioned 300,000 houses for Oxfordshire. That's an increase of more than 100% in the total existing housing stock of the county. It would more than double to the year 2050 if these plans went ahead. And you can see the other yellow splashes, the increase of those different counties is between 66 and 105%. And on the bottom right there is the Office of National Statistics predicted increase in the UK population to the same year, to 2050. So this whole region is accepting a disproportionate share of the projected increase in the UK population. The next, please. So our campaign against the expressway and the um, overdevelopment of the region began in about 2018. Next, please. We called ourselves the No Expressway Group. That was the immediate target. But we also talked about the overinflated housing target. And over those two years, we campaigned, we raised awareness. And in 2020, uh, just over a year ago, we presented our petition to 10 Downing Street to scrap the expressway. Next, please. And a year later, in fact, within the last month, the Secretary of State for Transport, Grant Shapps, has officially cancelled the expressway, which has been paused for more or less uh, a, a whole year, but not officially cancelled until last month. Next, please. Now, cancellation of the expressway, one of the links that links the, thousand, the million houses to the jobs is removing one of those five pillars. Next, please. If you remove one pillar, the question is, what happens to the others? How do you reduce or do you reduce the ambition for jobs, houses, and of course, the prize at the bottom, the increase in the economic output? Next, please. In the last month or so, two key documents have been produced which sketch out the present and the future plans for the ARC. The first is something called the ARC Spatial Framework from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, but you can see it's got the stamp of HM Government on it. This is in fact a Whitehall plan, it goes all the way to number 10. This is Boris's, one of Boris's favourite projects at this moment. And next please, the second document comes from uh, England's Economic Heartland, which is an area that covers the Oxcam Arc plus Hertfordshire and Swindon. And obviously that's to do with regional transport. The next, please. Let's look first of all at the Arc Spatial Framework document. It's concerned, as you can see, no, back one, yeah. It's concerned with economics, housing, the environment. You can see the list uh, there. It's emphasizing the protection of nature and biodiversity. It's emphasizing the protection of ecosystem services. But then C and D there, you can see it still has the same economic ambitions of the original Partnering for Infrastructure document. It's effectively a regional 
plan. It crosses boundaries between counties and tries to join them up into some economic unit. And it talks a great deal about levelling up. But for this document, levelling up means levelling up within the arc, not between the arc and the rest of the country. Next, please. In the case of England's economic heartland dealing with transport, it decided to look at a different scenario for the growth across the region. So it looked at housing delivery targets for the next 31 years. It simply multiplied those targets by 31 to suggest that it needed to accommodate 862,000 houses rather than the million and about one and a half million more people by 2050 in the area that it was covering. This would involve an additional 15 to 25 billion vehicle kilometres per year on top of the baseline 42 billion at present time. And there are five transport scenarios progressively reducing the carbon output from these vehicles. CO2 transport emissions in this document, Pathways to Decarbonisation, were reduced from the current baseline of 21 million tonnes at the moment to either 14 million under a business as usual scenario, which imagined continuing electrification of the fleet, but not total electrification, or in fact to zero million tonnes by 2050, according to the other four transport scenarios. But quite frankly, all that they did here was draw a line from the present baseline to zero at the target date of 2050. And they imagined various means by which we would get to zero by 2050. The update to that document of a month or so ago uh, reduces the timeline to zero from 2050 to 2040. That is now the new target for zero carbon emissions of the transport fleet of the Oxcam Arc. Next one, please. So going back to the regional transport strategy, it looks at both rail and road. These are the proposed rail improvements. Most of these lines exist, mostly radial from London, but the key one is the pale blue one there, East-West Rail. This is a resurrection of the old varsity line that was closed in 1960, and it will join Oxford and Cambridge. You'll be able to take a train between the two cities uh, in theory by 2030. Next, please. In terms of roads, the strategy doesn't talk about a single road, it talks about many different corridors, in fact 13 in total, 10 of which are shown on this map as the oblongs of various shapes. And perhaps a significant one is the rather strange shape marked A in brown around Oxford. It links Oxford to Milton Keynes. This is the original track of the expressway so we're going to get something that replaces the expressway in all but name. But all of these road corridors will be looked at for improvement in the next 30 years. Next, please. During a webinar following the release of this document, Naomi Green, who's the head of technical programmes of EEH, made a very strange statement. She said the road additions and improvements on this map are only to meet existing needs. The needs of the present cars, not of all those future cars. Next slide, please. So the question is, where are we now? Well, both of those recent documents don't actually mention the number of houses they're keen to build. But if you look at the ARC spatial framework document, it continues to talk about that economic prize, the 163 billion increase in the economic productivity of the whole ARC. And that number, you'll remember, does require the million houses, which the document refuses to mention, but if you mention the target price, you've got to mention the houses somewhere. The EH transport strategy also doesn't mention the number of houses because both documents acknowledge the number of houses has now become poisonous to the people who live in the art. They're really concerned, as they should be, by the scale of these developments. But that transport strategy document continues to talk about one and a half million increase in the population by 2050. That increase requires the 860,000 houses that are mentioned in the decarbonisation document. Next, please. So what we have is essentially the rhetoric might have changed in these official documents, but the ambitions have not. And the curious thing about these two documents, which in theory are talking about, well, they are talking about the development of the same area, is that they have very different ideas about where the houses that they're talking about should go. Could you have the next slide, please? The next slide is that map we had before from the National Infrastructure Document. And we've got as a call out here for Oxfordshire alone, 
that the NIC's allocation of the million houses puts 300,000 in Oxfordshire. The EEH's plan, 860,000 houses in total, allocates only 154,000 houses to Oxfordshire. These are very different numbers from two groups of people who in theory are working on the development of precisely the same area. Next, please. And the same is true of all of those areas in the arc. You can see in each case, the next call out will show you the NIC figures and then the EH figures. They're very, very different numbers. And the question for us is, well, which number is correct? We can't get straightforward answers out of this, but whichever number is correct would have very different implications for the development of the county and the region. And you notice on the right here that there are another 240,000 of EEH's houses, which aren't within the borders marked on this map. Uh, most of those will be in Hertfordshire, but they're in other parts of the, uh, that aren't within the ARC area as shown on this map. The next one, please. So what are the implications of the current plans for the UK in general? The Office of National Statistics predicts an increase in the UK's population of about 16% to 2050. That 16% increase across the nation would require 3 million more houses. Next, please. The Oxcam Arc area has only less than 6% of the UK's total population, but it's expected to provide a million of those 3 million. That's 33% of those houses. We are expected to provide a far disproportionate share of the future housing needs of the country within a very small area of the country. For the EH areas, you've got the figures there. It's still a small percentage of the population is expected to absorb a huge percentage of the increase in houses to 2050. How can these numbers be squared with the government's ambition of levelling up the nation? Next, please. In the next 10 years, about a third of the growth of the UK population will be due to the natural growth, that's the births minus deaths of the resident population. 73% of the growth of the nation in the future will be due to international immigration. This isn't a surprise to people who've looked at these figures over time. Uh, in 19 out of the last 21 years, for example, the increase in the UK's population has been more due to international immigration than to the breeding of the current resident population. Now, of course, immigrants come to England and they settle in England where the jobs are available. They are coming for jobs. Historically, we have created most of those jobs in London and the South East. So that's where the immigrants have settled and that's where the pressure on housing has become. If we put most of the new jobs and houses elsewhere, we put say 70%, it wouldn't disadvantage the current residents because the remaining 30% would actually be enough for the current residents and their children and grandchildren. But if we did that, we'd reduce the pressure on the economically overheated Southeast, we'd reduce the pressure on our natural environment, we'd reduce the pressure on water supplies, on the provision of electricity services to this region, which are already stretched. And we do a great deal more to levelling up the nation than the plans as they're currently envisaged. And just to remind you, of course, the UK's regional inequality is the worst in Europe. We have the richest city, London. We have three of the poorest regions in Europe. Next, please. What are the implications of the plans for Oxfordshire, not for the nation, for Oxfordshire? Oxfordshire's growth deal, which is the provision of 100,000 houses in local plans to 2031, is part and parcel of the ARC plan. The ARC plan is in the DNA of the growth deal. And the Oxfordshire 2050 spatial plan assumes the Oxcam ARC development as a given. It's part of the plan. Next. The Oxfordshire 2050 plan involves us building 200,000 more houses in the period to 2050 in order to achieve that target of 300,000 houses under the ARC economic ambitions to 2050. If we don't produce those houses, we won't reach the economic ambitions. The EEH plans involve delivering fewer houses in Oxfordshire to the same date, but it's still an increase of more than 50% in the current total housing stock of the county. Next. But we saw before, there's no planned increase in road capacity for the between 50 and 100% increase in the number of cars from all those new houses. Congestion is going to be worse without very severe demand reduction 
or a very significant increase in public transport, both of which we require, but nobody's quite sure how to do it. And the county's aim for zero carbon by 2050 would be much more difficult if, in the process of reducing the current carbon outputs to zero, we have to cope with an additional 50 to 100% increase in the total vehicle fleet by that date. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And you brought us bang on time, so I'm very happy about that. I was just about to send you a reminder, I didn't need to do that. So we have got a number of questions posted. I'm going to uh, ask our panellists to respond as appropriate. And the first one I've got, uh, a, hopefully an easy one to get this kick started, is from Ros Smith. And I think, Sarah, you've picked up this question already, if you'd like to answer about Capsia. Yeah, hi, Roz. Uh, thanks for your question. So, yeah, Capsia, I think it was, it stands for the Cycling, Pedestrian, Safety and Abandon Group that was set up back in the mid 1990s. Uh, we did think about that group in our Abingdon Liverpool Streets group. And there, there indeed is um, original representation from that Capsia group in our Abingdon Liverpool Streets um, group. And we felt though that Abingdon Liverpool Streets actually picks up some of those um, original um, issues that Capsia aimed to address. So, you know, we decided that it's great that we've got that representation from those original uh, people and that we would see concerns that were flagged, you know, over the, over the recent decades, we'll continue to pick those up. Thanks, Sarah. I think Roz has already posted her. Thanks for that. We've got a couple of uh, comments, questions about um, Broad Street, which I'll ask Brenda to pick up. One from Catherine McNichol. And it's something that, in fact, we were talking about earlier this week in COSAP meeting, um, the Oxford Preservation Trust proposing um, vehicle access from east to west. And Sushila also commented uh, traffic lights at the east end of Broad Street. Um, do you have a view on this, Brenda? Um, the, the, as I said, the showed was was just some ideas and certainly there are a lot of ideas um, around what should happen in Broad Street. First of all it is an important east-west cycle route uh, and it's also an important area for lots of pedestrians. So uh, our view is that, that, that both of the east-west continuity should be con continue. Um, there are definitely some issues around the fact that there are um, tourist buses going in and out and there is some debate about the extent to which uh, uh, Hollywell Street is an extension of bus routes from elsewhere and the extent to which it stays much like it is. Um, I think that most of COSAT's views are we, we don't want traffic introduced from the west into um, Broad Street uh, we want the whole area to be largely uh, pedestrianised. There will have to be some access for emergency vehicles and, for, as I say, it's important for cyclists. Um, the traffic lights in the east have been removed. Um, according to a uh, um, story I heard, they were removed because so many films, film crews, like showing that part of Oxford and you don't have... Uh, in historic films, so the, uh, the traffic lights were taken out, um, so I don't think they should go back in again. Um, I don't know whether that answers the questions for Catherine and Sushila, but that's the best I can manage at the moment. Thank, thank you, Brenda. Uh, uh, next up is for Robin. I've got a question from Hazel about Oxfordshire Cycling Network. If, I don't know if you've seen this one, Robin, if you're involved in the Oxfordshire Strategic Transport Plan, how come it's so vague? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I guess the one answer is we didn't write it. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> um, so the, um, the, I guess you're referring to the local transport plan there. The, the current version that's, um, that's out is the 
um, local transport plan four which came out in 2014 and was revised in 2015 if my memory serves me right there's been a recent consultation on the vision for the next version um, we've been consulted and on the steering group from that and so that's a, it, it's at a very high level at the moment and the, the work on the detail is is now going on um, in general our, our view of the previous one is a lot of there is a lot of good work on the words but it, it's been very much a failure of getting that into action um, and so we've mostly been disappointing in the implementation so we're hoping that uh, whatever the um, uh, whatever the county council that gets elected in May is much more disposed towards implementing good things around uh, active travel for both cycling and walking and we will be there um, campaigning and badgering and influencing and getting involved in as many uh, uh, many bodies as we can to try and influence them all the way along the way on that. Thanks Robin. Next question I'll answer myself. It's from Marco Antonio. And is there anything planned for places such as Berensfield into Oxford? And I guess the short answer is no. Um, there's a big focus on improving conditions for walking and cycling within the towns. And we think that's the right approach to get more people walking and cycling for short trips, for everyday trips. Um, but I know Robin has done some very good work on linking all the towns together because certainly with the advent of electric bikes it brings those kind of interurban distances into much sharper relief and, and whilst the focus uh, both for, for COSAT and, and for the County Council initially is to get those walking and cycling plans for the, the main urban areas uh, we haven't lost sight of, of linking those up and I know Personally, there's a, an excellent bridleway linking Dorchester, Berensfield with uh, Blackbird Lees and the, and the city um, that um, could be improved for uh, walking and cycling trips. But it is, it's pretty remote and isolated uh, during night. So, you know, there's pros and cons with those types of things. So thanks Mark, for that question. Um, and I can see David is typing an answer. I was going to bring you in, David. I can, uh, I can answer this one, actually. It's, yes, yes, go for it, yeah. So the question is, um, which other ministers involved? Um, from Charlie Hicks, we've got the Treasury, definitely, uh, the Department of Transport, the Department of Businesses, uh, MHCLG, the communities. It's all of the above, plus DEFRA for the environment, plus the Department for International Trade. And the last one, DIT, is advertising investment, inward investment, into the Oxcam Arc by the international investment community and we were informed at a webinar more than two years ago now that um, the DIT reports that international investors are queuing up to pour money into the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Now this against the background there's not been a single public consultation between any of these ministries and any of the communities across the Arc ever. Uh, this is a scandalous democratic deficit which really must be addressed. Everything has been behind us, closed doors to the moment. It's a case of all those ministries, the minister will not see you now. We've tried to approach each of them to hold public meetings, none has done so. Thanks, David. Uh, and thanks to Marco for um, posting your response there. I'm really sorry that participants can't join in this discussion. Um, I'm going to go Back to Brenda, there's a, a question from Sophia about bus lane for public transport on St Giles. Would we want to keep one? I don't believe there is an existing bus lane. But um, well, the, as I mentioned, on St Giles is there are no bus stops. So there's not actually a need for the buses to pull in and stop and, and obstruct the flow of traffic. We're also in expecting, and everything I've heard uh, <laughs> in the terms of rhetoric anyway, uh, is that there will be less cars going up and down St Giles. So with less cars and no bus stops, we don't need a bus lane. So uh, you could just narrow the amount that is the, the, the road carriageway, widen a, 
the amount that is for the bikes and all the rest could be for us. Uh, yes, Sophia's posted another comment about bus lanes not for stopping but for faster progress than cars. I think I think our view there is that once traffic levels are reduced, it shouldn't be necessary to have bus lanes in, in St Giles itself. And most people in the area should be aware that there is a um, design work has started on the Banbury and Woodstock roads. And obviously traffic is, some of that traffic is originating in St Giles, so that will have an impact there. I, I don't know, does anybody know if St Giles is within the scope of that? design work, maybe Alison know about that. Shall I answer that? For yes. The, for the, the Banbury and Woodstock Road, there is a current scheme going ahead, um, but it stops at the point of St Giles, so it doesn't okay. cover St Giles at all. Okay, thanks. Okay, we've got five more minutes. Um, some of these are just comments. I've uh, got a couple from Mark Harrison. Um, one is about are we considering anything like a ULEZ, ultra low emission zone? There are certainly proposals for a zero emission zone in the, in the centre of Oxford, which have been on hold uh, during the pandemic, um, but are, are about to be revived. So do, do take a look out on that. And starting with a very small area in the, cit in the city centre, but hopefully to be expanded and that's certainly our view that we want you know, as wide an area to be covered as possible. And the other comment from Mark, I'm not quite sure I've got this quite right, but um, should towns with the worst facilities for active travel be given a boost? Um, I, I think I know where you're coming from, that you know, if there are very low levels of walking and cycling, one of the big reasons for that may be a lack of infrastructure. <laughs> it's coming from um, Harrington. <laughs> uh, oh, I see. Yes, okay. And, okay, thanks, uh, Robin. And I, I guess th th there's certainly a case for that. It's a difficult balance because often the uh, we do sympathise with a local authority who has to make a business case to government for every investment, and you're going to get more impact for your investment in towns that already have modest levels of walking and cycling and the expectation those will be increased. So it, it, it is a tricky calculation, but, but, but not well made. Um, the, this, this next one is about, um, which is really one for, for us to direct to the county council, but Charlie Hicks is asking about the potential or the planned, as far as I know, it's planned, the Cowley branch line. Is there, are there any associated plans for walking and cycling networks? And that, it's a really good point that any new transport infrastructure, whether it's train, bus, or, or anything else, does need to be integrated with walking and cycling from the outset, rather than here's a station and you know, you're on your own of how to get there. So that's, that's a really important point, Charlie, that will pick up with the County Council. Um, there's a question here about inactivity, uh, Trisha's question about health effects of inactivity for young people. I'm going to ask Alison to pick up on this. Have you seen the, the question there, Alison? Yes, I have. And, and I think, I mean, there's obviously lots of evidence around how to, um, the, well, the damaging effect of uh, physical inactivity. And there are various resources around. I, maybe it's rather than listing them or kind of talking through now, maybe Tricia and I could have a conversation afterwards. Tricia, I come from a public health background and have a lot of interest in the health effects of physical activity. Well, the, the com I'm, I'm struggling to keep up. There's so many comments coming in. Uh, uh, Great debate here. Um, I'm going to struggle to pick up a lot of these though. Um, there was one I was going to go back to, uh, and thanks for your extra comment there, Tricia. Um, no, I've lost it now. We've talked about St Giles Affair, but I'm not going to go back to that. Um, just to say, Sushila, that we were talking about increasing space for, for walking and cycling. In fact, the proposals that 
Brenda showed on the slide would massively increase the pedestrian circulation space and the more modest increase in the cycling facilities and some cars. Uh, I'm going to close it there, I think. There's quite a lot of stuff. And if do feel free to provide any answers, both the panellists and I think other participants can provide any answers and contacts for those uh, flood of things now coming in as we reach to, in fact, we are now, yes, I'm going to close this. We are just a minute ahead of time. So I'm going to invite Leia, who's our new project manager for COSAT, who's uh, taken over from Abena, who's been running the show for the last two years. And we, we want to draw your attention to the upcoming district and county elections. Over to Leia. Thanks, Simon. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, we have been, um, we've designed a survey for all of the candidates running in the four elections within Oxfordshire, so the county council, county council election and then the district elections for the city, West Oxfordshire and Cherwell. Um, and so those elections are on the 6th of May. And so COSAT has produced a manifesto with 12 points putting out um, COSAT's position and has designed a survey that asks candidates views uh, with 12 questions, one about each element corresponding to the manifesto. We're going to publish this um, starting from the 19th um, of April, so not too long now, and I'm here to uh, get you excited and looking forward to uh, looking at these results by giving you a couple of um, screenshots of what the results look like now. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this is one of the first uh, visualizations you'll see. This is who has filled out our survey. So this was updated as of 8 a.m. this morning. Um, there are 570 candidates running across all of those four uh, elections combined, and we've had responses from 13.2% of them. This was up to 14% by the time we started the webinar. So responses are, are coming in, and we've had them from some from all of the, the major parties, uh, and we're going to keep on um, pushing to, to get those through. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is what it's going to look like when you get to interact with the results. So the results will be um, separated by the election. This is a, the first question for the county council. So it has the most different divisions. The other elections have a few less, so it's a bit easier to see them. But as you can see, I've, um, I've hovered my mouse uh, when I did a screen capture over one of the candidates. You can um, put your mouse over any of the candidates running. The little circles represent the different candidates. They're colored by party. So for example, my local um, division would be the one in Marston and I can see how many people are running. There's five candidates. I can roll over. Only one of them has responded so far, but you can see uh, Lucky Abingdon East, three out of the four of their candidates have responded uh, and you can see that they, they do vary and there'll be a slide per question that outlines the uh, COSAT's manifesto point and then what the question was that people were asked. Um, then on, on, yeah, the next slide is fine. You can, uh, you can move this data around. So if you notice the, the menu at the bottom right corner, you'll be able to uh, change around the colors, the size of the circles if you want, and do comparisons. So this has taken away the information about the division it, and it, by using the size feature, it's only showing us the responses that we have. Um, and so if you're interested in, in more kind of overall analysis, you can have a look and see um, how the different parties uh, candidates have responded. And again, if you hover over any of them, it'll give you details about what that individual candidate um, has responded. You can go to the next one. So that's just a quick, um, uh, description to, to give you a taste of what it's going to look like. Again, the questions are all based on our manifesto, which is available on the website. So you can see the sorts of things we're asking about on the website now. We're going to publish the initial results on the 19th of April, and then we're going to pub update this every one to two days, depending on the volume of responses we're getting. And we'll be sharing those on the website and social media as well. So uh, 
get excited to uh, investigate the results. Uh, and if you are or know a candidate, please tell them to fill in the survey uh, and be one of the now 14% and growing. Thanks everyone, back to Simon. Thanks Leia, brilliant piece of work. Do, do keep your eyes on the COSAT website and do look at all the other um, fantastic stuff we've got up on the on the website it, it is it's been relaunched and uh, rebranded includes um, reports from all the projects from the last year and details of the next year's uh, low carbon hub project i'd like to thank all the speakers um, do join us on social media and if you're interested in joining COSAP, particularly those um, from the towns outside Oxford, uh, do get in touch and we can invite you to our next meeting. So you can see what we do, we meet monthly. Um, I should have said at the outset, I'm cu currently co-chair of COSAT with Brenda, Brenda Boardman. And um, we've, like everybody else, we've been locked down and meeting on Zoom for more than a year and uh, looking forward to meeting in person. And I uh, hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you everybody for joining. And uh, take care and see you out on the, on the streets of Oxford, Jane. Bye bye. <laughs>